Thank you, Debbie. Thank you, Riley. Good job. Well, yesterday, your deacons and staff met together uh, almost all day long in what we have come to call our annual planning meeting. Some of you, many of you perhaps were praying for us. We appreciate that. We've done this for several years in a row where we stop, turn aside, and spend some time. We prepare for this meeting for weeks ahead of time, listening for God's Holy Spirit, and we just stop and take a hard look at where we're at, where we're going, uh, what we believe God is calling us to do. And I want to report back to you uh, the most important thing of all, which is this. God has a plan for Grace Baptist Church. And God wants to use us as a church family to reach people for Jesus Christ. That's why we're here. We're here to reach people for Jesus Christ with the gospel uh, of eternal life and to help those who have already found Jesus to grow spiritually and reach the highest level of maturity possible that God will allow us in this life. So we've got plenty to do, and we want to do a good job. You keep praying, and we'll continue to submit ourselves to the Lord and see what He does. I'm sure you noticed this week, one other thing before I, I uh, pass, uh, pass this up, I, I need to remind you and myself that we have a fundraiser today for our Uganda mission trip. And it's my favorite kind of fundraiser. It's where we eat food. Okay, so you stay. Uh, you're invited to stay after our worship this morning and have a uh, supper with us, lunch with us. Uh, we're eating some potatoes and all the fixings, uh, and we'd appreciate your help with that. All right, I noticed this, I'm sure you noticed this week that Billy Graham passed away, 99 years old. How many of you uh, heard Billy Graham preach in, in live? Quite a few. How many of you heard him preach on TV or in some, some probably, uh, probably just about everybody in here? Billy Graham uh, had a remarkable life. He preached the gospel to some 215 million people, not counting those who watched on TV and other venues. That's a lot of folks. And for uh, you've seen those crusades. A lot of people get saved. Uh, it's amazing to think how his preaching swelled the ranks of heaven. Uh, as he traveled around, they said, to uh, about 185 countries and territories to preach the gospel. An amazing life. Uh, sad to see some people attack him after he's dead, but in many ways that just affirms who he is. Because if you go out there and do the Lord's work and touch a lot of lives, uh, you're going to have some, some enemies uh, because we do have an enemy. And Billy Graham would have been the first one to admit that there were certain sacrifices necessary for him to follow God's call. We may look at him and think, gosh, look at this guy speaking in front of millions and uh, beloved by so many. But there were sacrifices that he had to make to fulfill his calling in this life. They may not be as evident. We look at Christians, for instance, in Iraq and Iran. We see pictures uh, of men whose heads are being literally cut off because of their testimony. And that's certainly a reminder that sometimes God calls for quite a sacrifice uh, from his followers. There are many who have sealed their testimony with their blood. Uh, and we're not finished yet. Uh, the greatest round of martyrdom is probably uh, yet to come. And so the question comes up, is Christianity really worth it? You know, if we could ask Billy Graham this morning, now that it's all over uh, and you know how the story ends, is Christianity really worth it? What do you think Billy would say? Pretty sure Billy would say, you bet. It really is, it, it is worth it. Uh, and others who have made big sacrifices, it would be great if we could ask them, is it worth it? I'm sure we ask ourselves, don't we, as we go along. Uh, as we see the sacrifices and the difficulties that we make, even though they may be minor compared to others, they're still sacrifices to us. They still matter to us. And we still ask the question, is Christianity worth it? Jesus speaks to that in our text this morning. And so I invite you to open your New Testament to Matthew chapter 16. We're in verse 20, Matthew 16 and 20. And we'll jot down a couple of things. There's an outline on the back of your uh, bulletin. If you'll get that handy in a pencil or pen. Matthew 16, verse 20 says this, He warned His disciples not to tell anyone that He is the Messiah or that He is the Christ. It's the same word. One's Greek, one's Hebrew. It means exactly the same thing. 
The Christ, or Messiah, in the Old Testament, it simply meant anyone who is anointed. Kings were anointed. Prophets were anointed. They would literally pour oil on their head as a symbol of the fact that God had chosen them and empowered them to carry out their task for the Lord and for His kingdom. But as time went on, this word, Christ or Messiah, the anointed one, had a much more technical meaning. It it meant one person, the one special Savior that God promised through Moses, through David, through Isaiah, through Jeremiah. As the years went on, the, uh, the anticipation built as God's prophet said, oh yes, He's going to send a Savior. He's going to send a a Messiah. Not an anointed one, but the anointed one. And so by the time Jesus comes on the scene, the people of Israel, they're waiting for this Messiah. They've got a lot of different ideas about who He is, but they're waiting for Him. And Jesus has just asked His disciples an important question. He said, who do people say that I am? They said the answer basically was, they think you're a prophet. And He said, well, who do you think I am? And Peter jumped out and he said, you're the Christ. You're the son of the living God. Peter becomes the very first person to recognize and confess out loud that Jesus is that one that God promised, that Messiah, that anointed one, the Christ. And he goes one step further and he says, not only that, you're the son of God. Uh, That was a big step. And Jesus commends Peter at that point. He says, you're blessed, Peter, Simon, son of Jonah, because You didn't get that on your own. Nobody told you that but God himself. That's a revelation from God. And I'll tell you this, your name means rock, and on this rock I'll build my church, and the gates of Hades will not prevail against it. Not only that, I'll give you the keys to the kingdom. This is a high place. This is a good day for Peter. He is walking six inches off the ground at this point. All right, And then Jesus turns to him and he says, don't tell anybody. Well, that seems strange. Things were just going so good. Now that we know He's the Messiah, we're ready to go out and take on the world. And He says, no, not yet. Shh, don't tell anyone. Why? Well, our text this morning shows why. Look what happens next in verse 21. From that time on, Jesus began to show His disciples that He must go to Jerusalem, suffer many things from the elders, the chief priests, and the scribes, be killed and be raised on the third day. Now this was a lot of information for the disciples, and it's new information. Jesus has hinted before this that there might be a violent end to his life, but he's never come right out and said it. On other occasions he said, the only sign that you're going to get is the sign of Jonah. As Jonah was in the belly of the uh, big fish for three days, so the Son of Man will be in the earth for three days. Well, what did he mean by that? When he said it, they probably didn't understand it, but it didn't sound good. When when he was talking about fasting, he, uh, he said, well, you can't fast when the bridegroom's here, but let me tell you this, there's a day coming when the bridegroom will be taken away, and then they'll fast. Well, what did he mean by that? They weren't sure, but it didn't sound good. All of that was veiled to them, but now that they know Jesus' identity, now that they know who he is, Jesus shifts gears and he says, now you need to know my mission. Now that you know who I am, you need to understand my mission. And let's get started right here with the most difficult part. I'm going to suffer and die. I, I feel certain that they never even heard the resurrected part because it was such a shock for him to say these things that when he got to the be raised on the third day, they were already uh, uh, stunned. Uh, And even if they heard those words, they probably weren't sure what they meant. They were still stuck on the suffer many things. Now here's a group that's mentioned too that would make it even more stunning. The elders, the chief priests, and the scribes. Up until this point, we're used to hearing about the Pharisees and the Sadducees. Now we get this group. Who's this group? The elders and the chief priests and the scribes. Well, this group is the Sanhedrin. They are like the Supreme Court of the United States of America. They are the Sanhedrin in Jerusalem. Jesus is saying, the highest authority in the land is going to take me out. That's an amazing statement for him to make to the disciples. That's a lot for them to have to digest. And not only that, he says that it is necessary for this to happen to me. A lot of our English translations just say that must, I must go to Jerusalem, so forth and so on. But when you dig down deep into the Greek text, there's something happening here where Jesus says, this is something that has to happen, guys. 
It, it, it is not that it has to happen because it's unavoidable that I can't get away from it because Jesus knows ahead of time it's going to happen and if he didn't want it to happen, he could have gone the other way like Jonah did. But he didn't. He set his face resolutely for Jerusalem knowing exactly what he faced in Jerusalem. And so he was submitted to the will of God. I know that I'm going to have to suffer many things. I know that I'm going to be killed, but I know that God's going to raise me up. I trust him, so let's go. Now, how did they respond to that? Not so well. Look at verse 22. Peter took Jesus aside and he rebuked him and he said, Mercy to you, Lord. This will never happen to you. Jesus turned and said to Peter, Get behind me, Satan. You are a stumbling block to me. You don't have the things of God in mind, but the things of man. Well, you know, every friendship has some rocky places. This is it for Jesus and Peter. Peter hears what Jesus is saying about suffering, and he doesn't buy it. Didn't Jesus just tell me that he's given me the keys to the kingdom? Didn't Jesus just tell me that I am blessed? Didn't Jesus just tell me that I've received revelation from God? Well, maybe it's time for me to use my authority and tell Jesus what he needs to do. And so he, at least he has the diplomacy to pull Jesus aside. You know, he doesn't rebuke him openly in front of the, uh, the, the other disciples, although that's a sort of a paternalistic uh, way to do it, too, if you stop and think about it. And, and he's, uh, he uses strong language here. Our, our English versions do different things with it. Uh, but he says, Helios si courier, you know, mercy to you, Lord. Mercy, Lord. Or we would say, heaven forbid, something like that. It's, it's an exclamatory remark. You know, he is in Jesus' face here. He says, it ain't going to happen. And Jesus shocks him out of his place of whatever his place he was in by saying, get behind me, Satan. Now, he, Jesus hasn't forgotten who Peter is. And I don't think he's saying that Satan has taken control of Jesus, but he's saying, you sound just like the devil. You sound just like the devil because he's been saying that to me ever since I showed up here. The first thing he did when I started my ministry after my baptism, when I was out in the wilderness fasting for 40 days, getting ready to preach, is he came to me and he said, all you got to do is bow down to me and we'll go right straight to the throne. You don't have to go to that cross. And so every time Jesus hears somebody say you don't have to go to the cross, he hears the devil. And he told, he told Peter, get behind me, Satan. You, you, Peter, you're sounding just like the devil. You're not thinking about the things of God. You're thinking about the things of men. The things of men are to protect yourself. Get all you can. Make sure that nobody takes it away from you. The things of God are that when, you, when God calls you to give it up, you give it up. Whatever it is, whatever it costs. That's the way God works. So Peter, who in one moment has been called the rock upon which the church will be built, has now become the stumbling block. From the rock to the block, all right? It's a long fall, and it was painful. The good news is that when we're blocks, blockheads, it doesn't mean that Jesus has given up on us. Because he doesn't give up on, on Peter here. And I love this part of the story. Because uh, Jesus doesn't reject Peter. He corrects Peter. Boy, there's, there's a whole lesson here for us in church. And... Uh, I, I wish we could just stop here and, and talk about it, but let me just throw a banner ad out, okay? Church, when people make mistakes, let's make sure we correct and we don't reject. And let's remember that when we're correcting to the other person, that correction a lot of times feels like a rejection. You know, when, when we are presuming to correct a brother or sister in Christ, and we should. But when we do that, we should have that holy fear that we're about to put our hands on the altar because that person belongs to Jesus. I don't care what they did or said. They belong to Jesus. And they're holy. And we're taking a holy vessel in our hands to presume to clean it off. We need to be careful. We need to be careful. 
If we have that attitude in ourselves when we correct one another, maybe it won't feel so much like a rejection as we deal with each other. Watch how Peter, how Jesus do, deals with Peter. Uh, and it's a, it's a good way, uh, good thing to follow. He's harsh, but Peter knows he loves him. Uh, and he never rejects Peter. He never re- and Peter's not through making mistakes either. He's going to make some more mistakes uh, before he's done. What, 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 is, what does Peter get wrong here? Let's write something down. Get your bulletin out, turn it over. What does Peter get wrong here? It's very simple. Peter does not want a suffering Savior. And in that respect, he's just like the rest of the world. Uh, One of the reasons that that Jesus tells them, don't tell anybody I'm the Messiah. Why not, Jesus? Because you don't want the real thing, and they don't either yet. Now, I've got to be honest with you. uh, There have been times in my life when I've asked myself if I really want the real thing. Because the real Jesus is tough. And I think in the American church, one of our biggest struggles is, is simply this question, do you really want the real Jesus? You know, we, we want a Jesus that's going to tell us it's going to be all right. You don't have to hurt. You don't have to give. You don't, you don't have to do any of that. We're just going to sing beautiful songs and laugh at the jokes the preacher brings, and it, oh, it's going to be so good. And we do all that, and the real Jesus doesn't show up. The real Jesus shows up, we're like, who is this wet blanket? We don't want any of that. Get him out of here. Jesus knew that, and that's why he told his disciples, A, you don't don't yet understand who the real Jesus is, and they're not ready for it, so don't tell them yet. But here we go. I'm going to start telling you who the real Jesus is. And he starts in on them, and what happens right away? They start backing up. Whoa, wait a minute. What is this? What is this? And Jesus is saying, this is the real thing, guys. This is what it's all about. So what what does Peter, what does he get wrong? He doesn't want a suffering Savior. The world doesn't want a suffering Savior today for a lot of different reasons. The suffering Savior says, here's one of the main reasons the world doesn't want a suffering Savior, because the suffering Savior comes in and says to us, your problem is a lot worse than you think it is. A lot worse than you think it is. You know, we put on our nice clothes and go down to our nice building and sing our nice songs. I know I'm getting, I know I'm walking on the yard here. I understand that. But Jesus says, you need to understand, I see your heart. And the problem is serious. And not only is the problem serious, but the solution is going to have to be radical. And that's what we back up from. Well, now, wait a minute. I'm not sure if my problem is really that bad. I don't know if I want that kind of solution. Suddenly, I feel like I'm at the dentist, okay? You know? This is going to hurt, and I don't want it to. And Jesus says, yeah, but it's real. This is the real thing. They didn't want it. Look what Jesus goes on and says now. Jesus affirms everything that Peter's scared of at this point. You know, some people at this point would say, well, now, calm down, Peter, calm down. Let's let's talk about this. It's going to be all right. Not Jesus. Not Jesus. Look what he says in verse 24. He turned to his disciples and he said, if anyone would come after me, he must deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. That last one sounds redundant, but let's look at each one for a moment real quick. Deny ourselves. What does that mean? Well, a lot of people say, well, I don't have a problem uh, denying myself things that hurt me. You know, I understand that I need to uh, eat less chocolate. Uh, I understand that I need to work out. I understand that I shouldn't be watching certain things on TV. You know, I'll deny myself those things. And Jesus says, no, that's not what I'm talking about. I'm assuming that you're doing that already. That's baseline. That's what we start from. We're not talking about denying ourselves sinful or harmful things here. God already assumes we've got that lesson. This is lesson B. Now he's saying, not only do you give up things that you shouldn't have that are harmful to you, I'm going to call you to give up things that you deserve, that you like, that are perfectly good, but I'm going to say, I'm taking that away from you and I have a reason for it. And we have to decide, am I going to give that up? That's denying ourselves. Jesus had no reason to give up his life. It was okay. He he stepped down from the throne. Things were good. Why would he take his glory off, step down from the throne, and then go to a cross? He didn't have to do that. That was voluntary. And what Jesus is talking about now is voluntary too. Deny ourselves. Sometimes God is going to come to you and say, I don't want you to do that. And you can say, well, why? I like that. And he says, I understand that, but I don't want you to do it. I want you to give it up. 
Maybe now, maybe permanently. Deny ourselves, take up our cross. It gets worse. It gets worse. The cross was an instrument of death used by the Romans that was so horrible that they wouldn't even use it on a Roman citizen. They only used it on the worst criminals. And I'm, I'm going to assume that uh, you, you understand how, how bad this death was. And so for Jesus to look at his disciples and say, take up your cross, that is, that's very stunning too. You know, a cross nowadays is a piece of jewelry. Uh, it's a nice piece of wood in the, in the sanctuary and all of that. But let's remember that the cross was an old rugged cross. It had splinters. And not only that, that, that was just the beginning. Crosses were soaked with blood. Crosses were places where people died. Not only did they die, they died shamefully. None of this, let's give them a, a shot and make, make death easy like we do nowadays. No, it's let's make it as horrible as we possibly can. Let's make it as shameful as we possibly can. And Jesus says, take up your cross and follow me. Now, what he means by that is that the Romans required the, uh, the person who was going to be executed to carry their own cross. It's bad enough to die on a cross, but to have to carry it through the streets of the city in absolute shame and then be put on it. And he's saying, your life following me is going to be kind of like somebody who's carrying your cross. You're on your way to death. You're on your way to death. Paul's going to put it this way later in the New Testament. He's going to say, uh, therefore I urge you, brothers, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as living sacrifices living sacrifices oxymoron sacrifices don't live well they do with jesus they do with jesus and then he says come follow me deny yourself take up your cross follow me why does he say follow me he said if you want to follow me follow me why because a lot of people want to but they don't and jesus is saying it's not good enough to want to you got to do it stand around and talk about it all you want how wonderful it's going to be someday i'm going to follow the lord it's going to be glorious I'll be the greatest Christian to ever walk the face of the earth. And Jesus said, I'm waiting because today's the day. If you want to follow me, then follow me. Now, he goes on. Uh, uh, J- Jesus I- I- is not finished. He, uh, he wants to make sure that we didn't misunderstand what he's saying because this sounds pretty extreme. Maybe we're misunderstanding him. Verse 25, he says, for whoever wants to save his life will lose it, and whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. Now, don't miss that for my sake, Okay. Jesus isn't telling us, just run right out and find the first person that will kill you and give yourself to them. All right? This, this, is, not, this is not a philosophy of suffering. Uh, it's a, it is a, an allegiance to a suffering servant. There's a big difference here. This is, this is not uh, just let's run out and find uh, all the suffering that we can. Uh, Jesus avoided suffering on many occasions. There were many times that they were ready to kill him and he slipped through the crowd and miraculously got away from them. This is, Jesus is saying, know what it is God's called you to suffer and do that. Because if we just try to impress everybody with our sacrifice and suffering, and it's the wrong sacrifice and suffering, all that's meant to do is bring glory to me, and that ain't going to work. And Jesus is saying, make sure that it's for my sake. Lose your, your life, your soul, for my sake. Next verse, verse 26 for what will it profit a man if he gain the whole world and yet forfeit his soul? Or what can a man give in exchange for his soul? Now he's moving toward the end of time and he's saying there's coming a time there's going to be a reckoning. And what we pursued in our life is going to be made, uh, it's going to be made evident before God to everybody. What did we value? And a lot of people are going to go out and try to win the world, whatever their world happens to be. They're going to try to gain it all. And in doing so, Jesus says, they're going to actually lose their soul. And they're going to realize at the last, uh, at the uh, final judgment, there's nothing they can give in exchange for their soul. They lost their greatest asset. Whatever you're struggling with right now, let me encourage you this morning. You have something right now that is of greater value than all the riches in all the world. You, right now, have in your possession something that is greater than all the riches in all the world. And I don't care what you're suffering, whatever it is, and I know everybody is going through some kind of difficulty right now, but what you have that is valuable will eclipse whatever your suffering is. If you multiply your suffering right now by a thousand, by ten thousand, the thing that you have that is of 
eternal value is still so much greater than that suffering that someday you're going to say that suffering was nothing. It was nothing. What is it that you have that God has given you, entrusted to you, that is of such great value? Well, it's quite simple, church. It's your soul. It's your soul. And nobody can take it from you, but you can give it away. And Jesus is saying, don't you dare give it away. You don't, you don't even realize yet what you've got. It is so precious. And there's nothing that you can give to get it back once you've lost it. The only one that can buy it back is the Lord Jesus Christ. And he's willing to do that. So why is it that Peter, what's Peter's real concern here? You know, Jesus has a way to talk right straight to the heart. Let's fill out another sentence here. A lot of times people talk to Jesus about one thing and he responds with something else. It's because he hears their heart. I am sure that Peter was genuinely concerned for Jesus. By now, they've been together for two years, two and a half years. Uh, I have no doubt that Peter really had strong affection for Jesus. And the idea of him suffering was repulsive. But there's more to it than that. And Jesus knows that. And that's why Jesus is saying the same things that he said. What is Peter's real concern? Well, here it is. It's the same as ours, if we're honest with ourselves. This is it. A suffering Savior may call his followers to what? That's right. If you follow the crucified one, you may become a crucified one also. That's why he says, pick up your cross and follow me. So a suffering, a suffering Savior may call his followers to suffer. So why? Why, why? why go to all the trouble? Jesus told his disciples, in the world you will have trouble. Why follow somebody like that? Is Christianity worth the trouble? Jesus knows that. He, note, I want you to notice what he does this morning. He gets it all out there. He says, look, let's, let's, let's make sure you understand the downside here before I tell you the upside. Because when you make your decision, I want you to be totally and fully informed. And he, and he throws the ugliest stuff out there, all right? I've taught the cross life over the years in many different places, many different groups of people, and almost inevitably somebody will come up to me afterwards and say, what you're talking about, preacher, is doormat Christianity, and I don't want to have anything to do with it. I've heard that many, many times. And in the past, I've always tried to reason with them and explain to them and so forth. And I, as I studied this week, I felt like the Holy Spirit saying, Richard, quit doing that. I don't need you to explain me. You just tell them what I'm asking for. If they want to walk away, then you let them go. If they want to follow, then you help them as best you can. So uh, the, the Holy Spirit said to me this, this, this week, that he said, Richard, this is what I would prefer you say. Here it is. I'm not talking about doormat Christianity. I'm talking about something that is even uglier and worse than the doormat. Because when Jesus was on the cross, a doormat looked better than he did. We're talking about going all the way down if that's what God calls us to do. Why should we do that? Well, here's the answer. It's in verses 26 and 27. Jesus said for or because. This is, there's a logical connection here. Because our question is, why should I do that? And he says, I'm going to tell you why. For. The Son of Man is going to come in His Father's glory with His angels, and He's going to give to everyone, to each one, according to their praxis, their practice. Not any one deed, but their life. Now notice He has switched back to Son of Man here. We've talked about this title. Jesus has used this title in a sort of a veiled way, but now He's pulling the veil off because we've... we've People would be wondering, is he, does he mean son of man like when God called Ezekiel son of man? Or does he mean son of man like when da Daniel saw a vision of someone who looked like a son of man, who was ushered into the presence of the ancient of days, was given the kingdom, was given eternal dominion, and was worshipped by all peoples in all nations? Surely he doesn't mean that. After all, he's just a carpenter and a preacher. He can't mean that, but now he's beginning to pull the curtain back and say, that's right, that's exactly what I mean when I say son of man. I am going to come in my Father's glory with the angels. Just let me throw that in to make sure you understand. He says, you understand what I'm talking about? I'm talking about I lead the angels. 
And then he goes on, he says, let me make sure you understand what I'm saying. I will judge everyone. The Son of Man, Jesus, the one standing right in front of you who used to be a carpenter and is wandering around the countryside preaching, I'm going to judge every man, woman, and child when that day comes. These are stunning remarks. But they asked, well, why should we follow you? And he's telling them, this is why. Because there is no higher power. There is no higher authority. At the end of time, when everyone has to answer, they're going to answer to me. He's saying, that's why you should follow me. That's why you should follow me. And they will answer for their praxis, their practice, for what they have done. Whether we've thrown in our allegiance with him or tried to do it on our own. And then he finishes up with verse 28. He says, amen, I say to you, or I tell you the truth, depending on how your English translation wants to render that. Amen, I say to you, there are some standing here who will not taste death before they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. Whew. That's another one of the statements that gets a lot of, a lot of conversation going among the theologians. Um, what did he mean by that? Well, he meant that there were some people standing there that would see the evidence with their own eyes that Jesus really is who he's claiming to be. If you look ahead in verse seven, uh, chapter 17, the very next thing that happens is what we call the Mount of Transfiguration, where his inner circle sees him glorified. Probably, at least in part, he's referring to that, but probably to more than that as well. Jesus is saying here that uh, I'm, asking, I'm asking for a lot, and I know that. And the reason that I'm asking for a lot, Jesus says, is because I give a lot. I give a lot. Here's the last thing. Let's write it down on our sins. Why should Peter change his mind? Why should we change our mind if we're worried about following a crucified Savior? Well, because sharing in Jesus' suffering means sharing in his, his victory, his glory, his honor, his power. Put a lot of words there. I put the word victory. Sharing in Jesus' suffering means sharing in his victory. Christianity church has gone through this struggle especially in the latter half of the 20th century up until now where because of the skepticism in western culture people are people say this well i don't know if there's a heaven or hell you know maybe when you die you just turn to dirt so maybe i need to get all i can out of christianity in this life and if you've got a version of Christianity that's not going to give me something, it's just going to ask for things, well, I'm not sure I'm interested in that version of Christianity because I'm not sure about what's going to happen when I die. And so Christianity, unfortunately, has responded by saying, well, now, wait a minute, Maybe let's talk about that. Maybe we can do something for you. Let, let's, let's see what we can do to give you some value now in your life. We'll help you with your marriage. We'll help you with your parenting. We'll... We'll make you a better employee. You'll make more money. You'll rise up in this world. Let's see what we can do to help you with your life now, to make your life better, so that you can uh, adopt Christianity, become a Christian, join our church, give your money to our church and your time to our church, and, and we'll give you something in return. Uh, and then if it turns out that when we all die, we turn to dirt, you know, we're all winners, right? Oh, and Jesus says, wait a minute. What will it profit if we gain the whole world? but lose our soul. What can we give in exchange for our soul? And I'm telling you this morning, church, that those who have that message, they have lost their way. Because what we've just read this morning, this is Christianity. This is the real thing. Jesus bids a man come and die, and a woman. One of the people that said that in the, back in the 20th century was a guy named Dietrich Bonhoeffer who escaped from Germany when the Nazis were taking over. And God told him to go back, and he did. And you know what he got for it? Killed. But you could not have, if you could have talked to Dietrich Bonhoeffer in 1944, right before he was going to die, you would never have been able to convince him to leave and save himself. He was ready. He said, if my Lord calls me to die, I'm there. Because I know what's on the other side. And I'm not giving that up. I'm not letting anybody take that away from me. It was one of the quotes from Billy Graham this week. Um, caught my eye early in uh, Wednesday when I saw that he had died. This one just shot all over the place right away. Uh, it goes something like this. Billy Graham said, one of these days you're going to 
read about or hear that Billy Graham's dead. Don't you believe it? I'll be more alive than I ever was before. I just changed my address. I'll be in the presence of God. I love that quote. That's a good quote. Now, let me, let me uh, suggest that you memorize that and plagiarize it. I want to suggest that you memorize that, take it, and, and make it yours. You know, Jamie, when you say that, say, here's what I say. You don't even have to say that it comes from Billy Graham. You just make it yours. Now, would Billy Graham agree with that? Well, let me tell you something. He would because he stole it from D.L. Moody. <laughs> he wasn't even the first one to say it, but he knew that. He knew that. But it was his. Because that statement belongs to every Christian. Every Christian. One day, you're going to hear or read that Richard Foster has died. Don't you believe it? Because on that day, I'll be more alive than I ever was before. I will have simply changed my address, and I will be in the presence of the living God. I hope that phrase is yours. Would you bow your heads with me for a moment? Can you make that affirmation? with Moody and Graham and me and, and millions of others, that you belong to Jesus. You know where you're going, despite the suffering and the struggles that you may experience in this life. You know where you're going. You know what your greatest value is. It starts by confessing Jesus, like Peter did. Confess Jesus as Lord. If you've never done that publicly, during this invitation, I'm going to ask you to come forward and say, this is my day. I'm ready to confess Jesus publicly as my Lord. I want to do that. I want to get baptized. I want to, I want to make those steps of faith. If you're ready to do that, you come forward. During the invitation, if you just need to come and get on your knees at the altar, maybe you need to rededicate your life to the Lord today, and you want to tell somebody that. You can tell me or one of these that are up here with me. Steve's up here. Maybe you just need to come and get on your knees and pray. Maybe you need to join the church. You know, whatever God is saying to you, would you say yes to him during this invitation? Father in heaven, thank you for speaking to us. Thank you for the truth. I pray that we would respond well to it. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's stand and sing. You come.